So shall I just start? Okay, my, I'm going to read and if I'm reading too fast or if I'm, my English is bad, I got it from pirated DVD, so if I'm not being clear, please just like clap or make sound so I, I hear. Okay, my first encounter with art was with this painting that was hang in my mother's office entrance, entrance for employees. Nothing special really, just that I see this painting almost every day when I pick my mom from her office. Ten something years later, I learned that the painting I saw was only a copy. The original one is painted by Raden Saleh Sharif Bustaman, born in 1811 and died 1880. The work is in the collection of Museum Mesda in Netherlands. Raden Saleh is known as the pioneering Indonesian modern painter. His romantic style was linked to the 19th century romanticism style that was popular in Europe. Some people think that he paints the beautiful and the wild Indies, but subtly he paints his concerns. Through this, the capture of Prince Diponegoro, he depicted the prince's expression as to be struggling to control his anger. I, I cannot point, but that guy who is looking a little bit up is the prince. He depicted the prince's expression as to be struggling to control his anger while the Europeans are static and avoid the eyes of others. Saleh was disagreeing to the perspective of the Dutch painter, Nicolas Pineman, who, who presented a submissive and beaten Prince di Ponegoro, standing lower than his capture, thus symbolically having less power. Hence the title of the painting, The Submission of Prince di Ponegoro to General de Kock. The painting was known to be commissioned either by de Kock himself or his family. Twenty-something years later, Goto Institute managed to do a retrospective of Raden Saleh in the National Gallery of Indonesia, the capital city of Jakarta. The curator was a German scholar, Werner Krauss. The exhibition marked as the first exhibition that people would actually queue for. And it beat any visitor count ever exist in that gallery. The Facebook page of National Gallery of Indonesia was celebrating the visitor count, of course. It was 20,000 people in 13 days. And yes, the show was only for 13 days. A comment popped up. Why are you proud of this? This is not your success. This is Gota Institute's work. Therefore, it is their success. You are just a rented venue. I lost it. You're just a rented venue, and it's the comment wasn't about being harsh or cynical. <laughs> it is the truth. Go to Institute made the exhibition. I'm mentioning this not because I want to dwell on the reasons of why Gota is doing that show or why wasn't any Indonesian doing the show, but I'm mentioning this because of the umbrella topic of ours, Global Academy. Oh, I needed to get paid to do something, right? I mean, I live in New York City. If you're not paid to do something, you're not going to be there very long. But this idea that I had to know what I was supposed to do now, like I was supposed to pursue this passion, was, it was bugged me. It always has. And it was a bit of a shock when I was in the Philippines and 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 I was in the and it's that you have one singular passion and your job is to find it and to pursue it to the exclusion of all else. And if you do that, everything will fall into place. And if you don't, you failed. The pressure starts really young and it goes your whole life, but it's perhaps most pronounced when you're graduating from school, right? Comes in, wow, the world's in your face. What are you going to do now? It's so intimidating. It's like picking a major for life. 
You know, I don't have enough time to give you a major for four years, and I changed that once, if not twice. I mean, it was like just intimidating, right? And this compelling, I mean, this really, you know, forceful cultural imperative to choose your passion, it's stressful to me, but it's not just me. Everyone I talk to agrees with me. The woman who told me this dress, I told her what I needed to dress for and what I was talking about, and she said, oh my gosh, I, I really need to hear this talk because I just graduated from school, and my friends and I, we don't know what we're passionate about. We don't know what we're supposed to do. I'm weary of passion for a few reasons. But one of them is that passion is not a plan. It's a feeling. Ah, there you go. Go to Institute. Now that I have to work with the framework of this lecture series, I'm reminded of Ruth Noack for two reasons. First, the start of her presentation where she asked, where is global? Of which I was a bit tempted to answer that question by raising my hand, simply because I am brown and a bit yellow by some ethnic lines. But that might have been a bad joke. Second is because Ruth told me that the timing of when Frankenstein was being written as an internal or insider kind of entertainment because there was nothing else to do that year, at this part of the world where we are now, it was 1860. And it was the notorious year without summer, or some people call it the poverty year. The year happened because of Mount Tambora's eruption in 1815. The volcanic ash caused global climate abnormalities afterwards. The mountain is located in Sumatra, Indonesia. Richard Wright described himself this way. A black American writer, journalist, civil rights activist who moved to Paris and become a French citizen. In 1955, he came to Bandung on his own initiative and expense. He wanted to witness the Asia-African Conference, Afro-Asian Conference, or more known as the Bandung Conference. His book, The Color Curtain, have become the main structure for the foundation of today's myth of the heroic conference. And I quote, A brief about the Bandung Conference. It was the large scale conference held in April 2018 to 24 in 1955 in Bandung, West Java. 29 countries participated in it. It represented nearly one quarter of the Earth's land surface. The total population of the represented countries is 1.5 billion people, roughly 54% of the Earth's population at the time. The conference was organized by Indonesia, Burma, Pakistan, India, and Ceylon, now we know as Sri Lanka. Why am I telling you this? 
With three other good friends of mine, we have been working on the Equator Symposium since 2012. It is run by the Jogjakarta Biennale Foundation, who of course, by its name, also holds the Biennale Jogja. The symposium based itself on the spirit of something that Indonesia's first president said when he officiated the Bandung Conference in April 18, 1955. In the speech, this is the first intercontinental conference of color people, so called color people, in the history of mankind. I am proud. I'm not really going to play all this, <laughs> but um, I just wanted you to see the setting and how proud he was at the time. He basically said, this is the first intercontinental conference of the so-called colored peoples in the history of mankind. And some part of the quote that we really liked was, what can we do? We can do much. We can inject various reasons into the world business. We can move all the spiritual, moral, and political strength of Asia and Africa for peace. I quote you also some of our introductory notes. Well, there's some people that should happen in the so-called people in India, and they are starved world, mainly because of the world, and they are 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 we feel we need to inspire ourselves, the people around us, and also the society in general, to realize that change can happen. We can implement it. The symposium wants to be bridged between as many local communities as possible from equatorial countries. Basically, we want to create a hub uh, amongst people from equatorial countries. We, we started from the idea of country, but we will not end with the idea of country. This may sound utopian, but it's okay to be utopian, as we learned from these people in the 50s. We launched Equator Symposium in 2000, 2013 with a one full day session with more than 20 speakers and moderators. held the very first edition in 2014. We enforced the open call model to widen our scope, and finally held it with 50, 40 people involved as keynote lectures, speakers, presenters, moderators, commentators. And the second edition in 2016, which you are looking at, also involved about 40 people within two full days conference. The third edition will be next year, 2018. We are of the opinion that lessons and reflections on the Bandung conference might provide us stock for further understanding of our own problems of today and also challenge. These efforts will supply us with many points from which to enter the issues and challenges that will be faced by the Foundation, along with its Biennale and its symposium, if it genuinely wishes to pursue a political agenda in the world of global contemporary art. We are conscious of this effort and is associating ourselves to what Richard Wright stated as an effort to control our own destiny. Therefore, the symposium focuses on inviting local geniuses. We believe that small occurrences here and there are triggers for various changes, the existence of which should be collected and focalized in order to continuously refresh our thinking and inspire ourselves. Their ingenuity in facing their respective national complexities along the equator is what we are interested in. The symposium positions itself 
as the connecting agent and also the point of dissemination for latest ideas, developments, and growth from all over the countries in equatorial region. I will now scale back to Indonesia, or even smaller, to Java Island, a research project that we have been working for five years now, four years now, the we now have changed. This is no longer Equator Symposium we. This is hyphen we. It's a collective that seek to sue bits by bits of the fragmented Indonesian art history. It's a collective of three girls, three women, me and my two best friends like best, best friends, Ratna Mufida and Pitra Hutomo. I will quote ourselves for a short explanation on this research. We started digging up materials from 2013. We went through several different archives, interviewed 15 exponents of the movements, gathered pictures from various photographers, media archive, etc. We have cataloged all our findings. It's available online. And we have written synopsis on each item that we cataloged. We have also published the timeline of the movement's activities during 1975 to 1989. We really wanted to make a major publication out of this, but of course there's no funding. So we had to exercise in creating demands so that the book is wanted and that people will work with us to make it happen. It's such a funny circling way that we had to go through. Nobody wanted us to show nor talk about this back home. I never really tried to analyze why, but anyway, the very first physical articulation was actually in Tokyo, in which we did an archive show with the Mori Museum Arts Research Platform. Early 2016. And the second articulation was in Melbourne, at the symposium titled Regions of Contemporary at the end of 2016. The symposium is co-organized by After All and the School of Culture of and Communication University of Melbourne. The symposium was to test ideas for forthcoming books in the After All editions of Exhibition Histories, produced in collaboration with the Center for Curatorial Studies Bard College. All these institutions and places I mentioned, nothing near home. Only the third physical articulation finally happened back home in Yogyakarta. We made an archival exhibition focusing only on the artworks produced within the framework of the movement.
By this point, we have got support from some funds for art and ecology. A new local grant giving foundation run by a young collector. We allocated those funds to fully pay for writer's fee and translation. Towards this book that we have dreamed of since the beginning. We now have 11 writers, curators, historian, artists from Indonesia and its neighboring countries. We are so happy that we soon can self-publish this book, at least the Indonesian version of it. As for the English version, we will be working with National University of Singapore, their publishing platform, in the next two years. Coming back to the show, we also launch our fundraising, fundraising program. It's a box set that contains 12 archival photographs from our research. Of course, with the consent of the artists, who have been very supportive of our research work. We are selling this in the edition of 30. What for? Well, to fund printing of the book and to actually do distribution of the book. And if we can really manage to sell, maybe to actually pay us that have done the research work. Uh, I've not even started to tell you my curatorial work. Oh well, maybe you just have to come down to the park where I work. <laughs> and I live. Within this year, I have two more exhibitions coming up in that side of the world. The closest one would be in September at Roh Projects, where I will be select showing a selection of works from 1980s to now that deals with the guilt of interactivity or exchanges through artworks, such as this. work by Sarah Noitemans, a Belgium-born artist who is based in Indonesia. And this is Malati Suryodarmo, an Indonesian artist who is based in Germany. Another one would be a mobile museum project that I co-founded with six other artists. We call it the Ansang Museum. It's a 60 kilogram museum consisting of miniatures and archives of eight artworks. That was that its public presence were rejected, be it by government, certain mass organizations, or the people. 
We have in our mind a number of concerns about the stability of ideas within democracy, as well as democratic behavior in today's society. Our main question is, what does democracy mean to each and every one of us today, as part of the society, as citizens, and as someone who works in the arts? The museum was made to initiate dialogues amongst the art sphere about these acts of limiting artworks and to seek where is our stance as the art community in dealing with these kind of issues. It is now already shown in three cities and soon to be shown in the fourth. All discussions that happen surrounded the show are recorded, transcribed, and then edited for publication purposes. Each show also have at least one new essay that tries to reflect upon this work, reasons of its limitation and relevance to our current situation. We plan the museum to end up in the form of book that reflects current thoughts on democracy coming from us, the art community. Okay, I'm up for questions now. <laughs> Thank you. No. Uh, it would interest me. What do you mean by from where do I get the ideas? Uh, uh, is it just, I had the impression when you talked about these different groups you are working with, yeah, that there are a, a group of friends and from uh, discussing under uh, your friends, you have the idea you uh, wanted to uh, deal as Therefore, I thought you were art historian with the uh, Indonesian new art movement, for example. Or is there a university uh, who commissions that? Or how, how can I imagine uh, these uh, uh, projects to develop? Well, institutions, for one, they exist, at least by name. I mean, art school, of course, is there. There is the National Gallery. There is also art centers in uh, 27 provinces that exist in Indonesia. And there are government money that goes in there, but that is almost completely unrelated to the actual practice because all institutions are run by government workers and they're not art practitioners. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they wear uniforms and all that. And I don't know, maybe they go to art school, but they don't end up becoming an artist and they needed something stable. So they work for the government. Th they exist. Uh, I mean, we have like Jogja National Museum, National Gallery of Indonesia, uh, Medan Art Center. You know, names sound familiar, but they don't operate the same. My most popular example is this thing called Jogja National Museum. When you hear museum, so you imagine it's a collecting institution, but it's not. Maybe it's just collecting the nostalgia with the fact that their building was the first art school in, in the country. But uh, it is actually a rented space for exhibition. I mean, I can, if I have money, I can do any show I want and they, they will not censor anything that I propose. So by names, places exist, but uh, they don't function the way we imagine them to function elsewhere. And to do all these kind of things, like the research with, with uh, Hyphen, is because where we work, where we are at, um, mainstream history for one don't exist. There are several books that people tend to refer to, especially if you go to the art school, but all of them are written by foreigner. And all of them are written by either anthropologists or uh, archaeologists. So it's a different way of looking at art history. Therefore, I don't say I am an art historian. But 
because people are alive and the scene are vibrant. You hear things about the past and some of the artists are still showing in the same exhibition with younger artists. So things become kind of like mythical or fictional in a way because stories travel through words and then no images. How, how does that work? And when someone say, oh, in 76, I did this show and I fight with this guy and this happened and that happened. It's just one word against another. And then this uh, new art movement thing is the very big myth that everyone acknowledge as the beginning of contemporary art in Indonesia, whatever that means. But um, it's just funny. You hear that and then you don't see anything. <laughs> So we think to get over with it, it needs to be written as something that people can refer. Uh, it needs to be a major publication on them. That's why we started with just being curious about hearing a lot about this thing, but never seeing, maybe we only saw five works or six works and not even any exhibition shot. So we started with that curiosity. And then, of course, when you start searching and then you start telling your friends, it becomes another myth. So we think to make a book is kind of, at least that's to stop the myth. <laughs> it's there. Yeah, there's no, there's no, yeah, well, the art school where they, all the exponents of the movement came from, once asked us to do an exhibition, but it was too impossible to work with them. Um, <coughs> Hey, can you do a show? When? Three months. What? How can you do a show in three months? I mean, we, <laughs> you can't do a show in three months. So they're not helping in that sense. There are other institutions that are interested in what we're doing that helps partially. For example, Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. Um, they help us, they help fund several translation projects. And uh, who else? National Gallery Singapore also because they collect the works. Mm -hmm. So they also help fund several archives, mm -hmm. which then become materials that we can give to uh, the writers who don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. and just things like that. So bits by bits, there's always like other people or other institution help, helping or working with us along the way. but. There's no, it's not something that I can formulate. Like if you want to come to Indonesia and do research, this is who you approach now. Okay. It's not gonna happen that <laughs> way. And who is your public? The art scene uh, or also wider public? The first, uh, if for publications, first I would start with the art scene. Yeah, yeah it's a huge population. But the, the museum project, it, starts with the art scene, but it's trying to reach uh, different publics. Yeah, but you, and you showed this uh, exhibition, which the Goethe Institute uh, did, and it must, there must be a huge public. Uh, as long as you advertise it in TV, yeah. as long as you can pay the this TV. This is make this kind of TV uh, yes. <laughs> thing for us also. <laughs> <laughs> so other questions? What's the name of the museum show? Like the, the show at the end, the traveling? Ah, uh, Unsung yeah. Museum. Like the Unsung Heroes. And these were all works that had been somehow not allowed to become public? They were all initially shown, like in either in public space or in a museum or in a gallery. But then someone else protested, like neighbors or um, mass organizations. And yep, someone protested that the work had to be closed or just not shown again. I try to avoid the word censorship because technically it's not that. It's just people not being able to manage its presence because everything is a matter of negotiation. Concept of uh, the guild of interactive 
Why did I imagine you would ask that? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of hoped Sarah's work explained it. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a long story. I really hope this work that ha have explained it. Like, there's this thing with the word interaction and also like performativity of a work that kind of change. Um, and to add the concept, like participatory as a concept, changes the way people make work and changes the way people talk about that work, their work, but not the way they make their work, which I find a bit problematic because those are just words or concepts imposed on the similar thing that you have done since the 80s. Actually, it's trying to be cynical with that. That's why I want to go back to the 80s and show the works that did not use such concepts but operate in a stronger manner. So, yeah, in a way, it's, it's more like uh, the art audience is the public because this is going to be shown in a commercial gallery. And in that setting, I, I like to show works from the past, not necessarily highlighting it as a historical piece, but just for people to be able to learn and to see what have happened before. So is it like the artwork uh, traits, the meaning that it contains in itself, or this like theoretic, uh, theoretization of like, in, in the language and in the description? The, the ideas that or the, the concepts that are brought by the theories exist in the work even before the concept the theory exists so and some artists who now deals with that concepts don't see it that way that's just it i mean it's a simple yeah it's a simple thing you think this is that but this is not that and then yeah <laughs> just something like that and usually in these shows in commercial galleries i don't write wall text I let the work speak. I mean, I just, yeah, navigate with the gallery owner, the artist, and then manage a talk, manage two talks. Uh, please use the microphone because it's a video. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, just a quick question. I, I, um, was in Jakarta for three months last year for an artist residency, and I totally fell in love with the place. Um, but one thing I realized in the art scene was people always introduced themselves, or the artists that I met, as part of a collective. And I realized that this was kind of an ongoing theme in um, at least the Jogja art scene that I, I met. So it, it would be like, I'm from like Mess 56, or just, you know, like collectives. And I was just thinking, um, because originally I'm from the Philippines, and it's a very individual practice over there, not really as um, collective filled as uh, Jokra. So, um, yeah, I just found this really striking, and I was wondering if you could maybe give a comment about this collective versus the individual art practice, and why it's such a strong group um, kind of endeavor um, in Jokra. I don't. I think no one can afford to do things alone. That's just it. <laughs> That's the very simple answer. And also, yeah, like theme-wise or thinking-wise or space-wise, you can't do it alone. So you need. You are a part of more than three collectives because of that. And also, like working groups, people just impose the word collective on them. Actually, actually, I just. It's just my friends and I. Yeah, just because we keep working with each other, then we are, we are named as collective. But you also share preference, so. Yes, because we can't, we can't, we don't, we can't afford it alone, so <laughs> we need that, to share. Does that get problematic in terms of if one becomes more popular as an artist versus? The, the, there are quite, uh, there are quite a lot of examples, like, you must be familiar with the Jogja contemporary art map. That must be the first thing that is given to someone who arrives. It's a map that is made by one of the art spaces. 
that ha now the 2017 version have 56 spaces in that map and uh, maybe 80 percent of them are gallery space studio space and gallery space at the same time they're owned by artists there are private houses that are made public or rented spaces that are ma made public. In, in that sense, like, um, if one gets rich, that actually means he's got to pay the bills. So <laughs> he can escape or she can escape, but no one escaped friends. It's dreamy in that sense, Jogja, but it's a little bit different if you travel elsewhere, like Bandung, or Jakarta, the shared spaces, the shared expenses are actually written down. Because <laughs> people can't live just by being artists. They have to do, they have to work something else. So I don't know if that answers. I, I, I really don't think there's any other reason behind this idea of collectiveness and uh, community dri driven kind of projects it's just because you can't do it alone I mean you there's nowhere you can apply where you can do it alone so you need to work it out with other people moreover there are collectives in the Philippines as well like Renan's collective uh, yeah. it's him now alone <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but there's also green papaya. It's a similar so model. Only once green papaya in comparison. There's also planting rice. Yes, but there's just <laughs> <laughs> there's just two of them. Yeah, yeah, like uh, um, mass fifty six is so, sounds big because there's like fifteen of them, sixteen of them, all boys decided not to want to grow up kind of all boys, there's only one woman and she's the manager, a paid manager. So, well, yeah, they, need, they needed the space and also I think they needed to nurture this uh, practice because uh, photography, as they think, is minority in terms of contemporary art. So they stick together because of that, but they all have individual uh, careers and Actually, there's only maybe three or four collective work that they have made as a collective since they exist in 2002. What? But can you explain why you didn't react to the prompt of Southeast Asia? It's not our needs. <laughs> it's a framework imposed. I'm not rebelling against it. Like I work within the, fr the framework too, I can. But it's uh, for the Sun Shower show, I really like this story because that was my proposal for the title of that show. We should have titled it Difficult Neighbors. It makes more sense. I mean, everyone, every, like what, the 10 ASEAN countries or Southeast Asia, like how large is Southeast Asia? Are you going to say that Timor is Southeast Asia? And when you say Timor is Southeast Asia, how would Indonesians react to that? Because Timor rebelled from Indonesia and like, okay, if you say Southeast Asia, where are you going to, are you going to still call them Burma or are, are you conscious that you have to call them Myanmar? You can't call them Burma now? And if you see it that way, and then you start talking about Islam and everything, um, where is Rohingya? And only two, two provinces in Indonesia accept Rohingya refugees. Not Thailand, not Philippines. There is very particular problems in different points of this dreamy thing called Southeast Asia. 
I mean, yes, they united in 67, consciously, six of them, and then slowly they become 10. I think that's a self-defense mechanism. ASEAN as a unity is only a symbol, and we all know that, and we all acknowledge and celebrate that. There's, every two years, there's a um, exhibition, art exhibition, ASEAN art exhibition, since, <coughs> I think the first one was 80 in the Philippines. And then every two years, there's also a public sculpture exhibition, ASEAN. No one knows, no one goes. And yeah, I think if we try to Google the list of artists, maybe it only grows, like only added 10 names since the first time they were held. Like, so how can I talk about Southeast Asia? I don't think, I mean, yes, we all know each other. And of course, after budget airline in 96, travel have become easier and we have become more friendly with, with each other. <laughs> but it's, 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 uh, then we have to talk about the roles of Singapore being the ones that can afford it. That where all the flights started from that's when the neighboring countries become more neighborly in a way. But the problems remain and even though artists travels, they travel with their work and their idea. It's really difficult to synchronize the positions, to acknowledge what is politically happening here and there and how it is imposed to everyone individually. And I think at least there is the same consciousness amongst practitioners within the region that you can talk about other country, but you don't really understand it. So it's, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, it's also the dilemma, of course, of a global academy. Yeah? And I often ask myself, how uh, can we learn uh, most about different parts of the world? And of course, you always frame it in a way geographically, also knowing that this makes no sense, but how other what is another way of framing it? What is another way of doing the research? Then can speak to the people there, go there and try to do research. But still, I mean, at least me as a Western trained art historian, I always try to find uh, a framework for what I'm seeing and, and then test if this might be a good idea to think like that or if you say this is stupid. Yeah. And for example, when I went to Singapore, to the Singapore, uh, National Singapore Museum, where they say they show East Asian art, for me it's totally, I couldn't understand anything in a way. Yeah. It was very mysterious for me. But then you could also not talk to the people there because they're not talking to you. I mean, I had the impression anyway, very few people speak openly. So it's really difficult. Yeah. So therefore, I'm very happy you tell me something, although it's a little bit, uh, I don't understand it. I mean, I understand o only very few things. And I think it's like a mosaic. You have to try to find more mosaic stones. Yeah? Or I, yeah, not you. <laughs> yeah, that I think that's why I titled it Function Over, over Passion. I mean, yeah. what is needed now, that is what we do which is why it's very difficult to map it. Because yeah. what we figured or what we found out that now this is what is needed and then some of us agree, we just do it. And then maybe after it's done, we realize, oh, maybe that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but what do we do? Uh -huh. and, and for example, when you do this work here now, uh, is it interesting for you? In, of course. I wouldn't have said yes if it's not interesting. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe more talk about what is interesting about. <coughs> what is interesting about? Oh, <gasps> now I'm being evaluated. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. I always see like being in other places and being with other people as something interesting because it's impossible you don't learn anything. Or maybe you don't want to learn, then you don't learn anything. But it's always good, no? Yeah, I'm just asking because you're one of the people who have refused an easy kind of networking internationally. 
flash to me that has from time to time been offered to you when you were saying, actually, I'd rather concentrate on a certain kind of locality. Like the, the, the Ansan Museum could be shown elsewhere, but first you want to have it shown or, you know, shown in, you know, networked easily to be distributed or so, where you actually wanted to be shown in Indonesia, also beyond Java, right? Before it goes somewhere else. So you're, you're I don't know a lot of people who travel because they get the opportunity and it allows them a network and that's it. Also from our side. Of course. Well, particularly for that museum, it's because it's made um, within the questions of what does democracy mean in our context, like in an Indonesian context. Of course, it may make sense, like if you show it in Vietnam and you talk about censorship in other places of the world, that might be a good way, a good tool to address issues that they are also facing. Or Thailand, which is also facing censorship, um, much more vigilant, much more violent than Vietnam. Uh, things like that, but um, for now, for me and for the seven of us who made that, we have a lot of questions towards Indonesia. It's so big and it's technically cheaper to fly back and forth to Singapore than for me to fly to Borneo, for example. So it's much more intriguing and interesting in that sense. Also, outside Jaffa, Indonesia, the general Indonesia that people know, I mean, oh, tourists would say Bali, but uh, the idea of Indonesia and what people generally know of Indonesia is Jaffa. It's not really the archipelago. It's very different. If That's also why I try to enforce in my biography that I live both in Medan and in Yogyakarta. It's really important for me at this point because it's very different. You speak the national language with different dialect, with different intonation, and then you completely don't understand each other. How does that work? And you think you understand because you speak the same language. No, you don't. And that has become for a lot of us, not only me, has become a more interesting challenge because to travel aboard, abroad, especially for artists, you write application for residencies, then you go. But uh, how do you find out about what's happening in Bandanaira, in Molucas, in North Sulawesi? There is almost no way you can access that. That's why I think we, we devise it in that way. So that becomes a reason for us to travel elsewhere. Maybe. I don't know, easy networking. That I don't have to answer that, no? 